Welcome to The Lawyerist Podcast, a series of discussions with entrepreneurs and innovators about building a successful law practice in today's challenging and constantly changing legal market. Lawyerist supports attorneys building client-centered and future-oriented law firms through community, content, and coaching, both online and through The Lawyerist Lab. And now, here are the co-authors of The Small Firm Roadmap and your podcast hosts. Hi, I'm Laura Briggs. And I'm Stephanie Everett. And this is episode 326 of the Lawyerist Podcast, part of the Legal Talk Network. In today's episode, I'm talking with Tom Lemfeski about buying and selling a law firm. Today's podcast is brought to you by Text Expander, Postali, ESQ.marketing, and Sweet Process. We wouldn't be able to do this show without their support, so stay tuned. We'll tell you a little bit more about them later on. So Laura, I'm really excited for people to hear my conversation with Tom because I had a great time talking to him about the process of buying and selling a law firm and really thinking through, you've created this business. Now, what are you going to do with it when it's time for you to go on and do something else? Yeah, I think this is something that is really exciting news that was released recently about the partnership with the Law Practice Exchange and how that kind of fits into the general vision that Lawyerist has for the future of law. Ultimately, your goal is to build a firm that could potentially exist without you, right? So I think it's really exciting. I'm very interested in hearing your thoughts on this episode too, so I can't wait to listen to it. But I know that you talked with him about buying and selling your firm, but there's all kinds of different plans that are too easily neglected or forgotten about, right? So what are some other ways that lawyers should incorporate planning for potential issues in the future? You know, what happens to your business if you're in a awful accident and you need emergency surgery. So there's no time to give instructions to anyone and you're going to be out. You're going to be out of it for a while. The good news is you're going to live and you're going to recover. <laughs> and so you want a business to return to. But in my scenario, somebody else is going to have to come into your business and keep the trains on the tracks and do things, right? So first of all, who is this person? Who in your life can fill this role for you? And then how are they going to get access? Do they need access to a physical building? Do they need access to your computer files? How could they very easily notify all of your clients that something has happened to you and you're going to be out? Or are there essential team members that they would need to notify? What about the court? How would they find out if you had a hearing the next day? or a pleading deadline the next day that couldn't get moved. This makes me think about a situation I encountered a couple of years ago as a freelancer, I was working with a client and all of a sudden the owner of this business who had been my point of contact, he passed away and the employees did not even know where to find this information. So they couldn't log into his computer. They could not even see the financial files because there may have been instructions stored somewhere on that computer, but they couldn't even get into it. So you've got to think about some of these things, like even the basics, right? Where are the instructions or where is the manual or process for if something were to happen, do the right people know where to find it? Because otherwise things can become really chaotic and stressful. In addition to all of your employees worrying about you and hoping that you and your family are okay, they may be trying to pick things up and keep the law firm running and make sure that your clients aren't impacted negatively, but you have to empower them to be able to do that. If this is something you've neglected, don't. Whenever you get to a place where you can write something down, go to your calendar and schedule a time to do this. I'm not saying you have to do it right now. I'm saying you have to schedule a time to do it right now as you're listening to this. It's not going to take you a long time, maybe just an hour or two to kind of think through what would need to happen and then write those instructions out or better yet, guess what you guys, you have this really cool device in your hand, probably your phone. You could record a memo or you could do a screenshot using Loom, which is an easy tool that we like to use because you can just hit record and you can say, okay, the worst has happened. Here's what you do. You go into my computer and just like, if you do it and just go through that process and narrate it, it's going to be super easy. It's going to take you no time at all. And then you print the instructions on how to find that video or whatever it is and put it in an envelope. I feel like there needs to be a physical component as well. And it's like, here's where it is and tell multiple people that if something happens, this is where you go. 
I love that. And I think there's also so much power in thinking about the people that they might need to contact, right? So is there someone who's in charge of your office lease? Is there someone who is handling the tax filings for the firm that maybe your office manager doesn't know or doesn't interact with those people because you're the one handling it? So making these instructions, enabling them to get the materials they need, and then leaving behind at least the name, if not the name and contact number or those types of things can be really helpful in those emergency situations. It's our already stressful enough. So make it a little easier for them to find it. So that's your important reminder. And now we have Stephanie's conversation with Tom. Hey, I'm Tom Lundfesty, the founder and CEO of the Law Practice Exchange. The Law Practice Exchange is the marketplace for buying and selling law firms. And we're proud to say that we help owners of law firms create continuation plans to make sure their law firms can continue even when they're looking to step aside. And for the next generation, we're looking to provide those opportunities, growth through acquisition. Awesome. Welcome to the show, Tom. I'm so excited to have you today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So full disclosure, let's just get this out of the top. Lawyerist just recently made a strategic investment in the Law Practice Exchange. And so we're super excited to be working with you. Yeah, very excited as well. So I wanted to have you on the show today because I know this is something lawyers kind of kick around and maybe think about or maybe don't. So I think the first question that you probably always hear is, can you really sell a law firm? Is that, is that even a thing? Is that possible? Yeah, absolutely. And the answer to that, of course, is a hard yes. Almost 10 years ago, when I started the Law Practice Exchange, that was probably the biggest question or accusation or whatever you want to call it is, can you sell or you, I don't think you can sell a law firm. And really, when we look back, ABA Rule 1.17 gives you guidance to say, yes, you can sell a law firm, especially solos, small practitioners. That was put in place really to you know, develop a strategy for solos and small practitioners to receive some of the benefits that the larger firm partners were able to receive when they retired. And so I think it was a great thing that the ABA recognized solos and small firms. You've built value as well. And there is a way to sell and transfer it. So what we would say is pretty much every law firm is sellable. It's the way that you want to approach it and make sure that you do it under the right way to preserve and transition what value you've received. Yeah, that makes total sense. And I want to get into all the steps and how it looks. But before we do that, we should just take a second and address what's going on in Arizona and Utah, right? Yeah. Arizona, Utah have passed regulations, each a little bit different. Utah's kind of got their sandbox that you can apply, but it deals with non-attorney ownership of law firms, which is pretty commonplace, again, in other foreign jurisdictions, England, Australia, Europe, other places closer to the U.S., you have you know, other professions like CPA firms that can run a law department. And you have non-attorneys, meaning public, Joe Schmo consumer, or equity groups that can have ownership in a law firm. And so Utah has kind of opened that box up as well as Arizona. Part of the reach and the goal was, as passed by the Supreme Courts there, was really the gap in legal services, right? And providing those services as things got more and more expensive, they're hoping to develop alternative platforms. The big change, though, is having non-attorney partners opens up a lot of different innovation opportunities. Some people think that's going to be good. Some people think that's going to be bad. I like to tell people that I try to be a student of other industries or other professions. And every other profession has really moved to non-professional licensed ownership in some way or shape or form. And I'm sure there's good stories and there's bad stories, but it's definitely evolving our market. So supposedly California might be the next one to move. And there, I think, is about 15 or 16 other known states, some secret committees, some others that are considering changes as well. So it's been interesting, you know, through COVID and otherwise, some of these changes have happened. And it'll be interesting to see how they play forward in the next couple of years. Yeah. But I guess the short story here is, yes, you can sell. Who you can sell to may depend on which state you're in right now. That's right. Utah and Arizona, your options are a little bit more open. Other states that may be coming, at least for right now, you could sell to another licensed attorney. 
I also feel like when we say the phrase selling your law firm, probably the image that comes up for most is the idea that you're selling to an outside party. But the reality is people have been selling interest in their law firm for many years because people will add equity partners. And I mean, isn't that in essence what you're doing when you do that? (laughs) Absolutely. We talk a lot about the apprenticeship model that I think a lot of, especially a lot of small firms, solos have tried to do in the past. But when it works successfully, you hire somebody, right? And you mentor them, you train them, and then they become a partner. And then over time, they take on more work and you slow down and you retire. And there's been probably some value exchanged as part of that. And so that is still what we call an internal sale is definitely a component. And, you know, when you have those candidates within your firm, even if you're a solo owner with one associate or you're a small partnership and you've got a couple junior partners, non-equity or associates, that's usually a preferred path to look at. But we also like what we'll call the external marketplace sale, which is really just trying to bring more buyer candidates to the table, right? Yeah. Because sometimes the internal candidates are great attorneys, they're great associates or otherwise, but maybe they don't want to be owners or they're not you know, willing to take on that risk or they don't really want to be or have that ownership burden on them. So we like to explore kind of both for any clients that are really looking at that exit and continuation plan. Yeah. So let's look at that process because I'm sure a lot of people, they might not even understand. So if I was thinking about selling my law firm, what does that process even look like? How do I get started? Attorneys would love this. We start with, of course, discovery. From a financial sense, we want to get all of our financials together and really come up with a valuation assessment, a potential price, price range, whatever else for your firm. So that's something that we, the Law Practice Exchange, do for our clients looking for transition, exit, continuation, buy-in of junior partners, whatever their plans are, we're going to start with that. But on their side, and what we help with as well, is also goal setting. For a lot of owners of firm, their goal might be, I want to sell as soon as possible. And so if that's the case, right, then your path or your exit strategies may dictate others want to maximize their price. Others really aren't worried about price. They want to transfer it to the next generation, and they're happy to do it at a very significant discount because maybe that next generation's work form for 15 years is a great associate, and it's more about continuation of care to the clients or otherwise. So we start with valuation along with goal setting and kind of priorities for you as the seller of what really matters to you. And then we really go into deciding which path may be the right way to achieve those priorities, those goals based on some financial metrics, price terms, those different things. That makes sense. And so let's just pick one and okay, I've decided I know about what I think my firm is worth and I've got a time frame in mind and it's not immediate, but it's not far off. Like it's a reasonable, I don't know what that looks like. Then what happens? Yeah, absolutely. Then it's really looking at have we chose a certain path? So we like to work with owners of firm to really what I'll call put a a sell package together. And so part of that is, of course, what you just noted, price, terms, everything else. Once that is together, then the goal is to find the who. So who is going to be that qualified successor? For you, if it's multiple owners, for the firm in general, and that's where we look to internal candidates. And we'll also look to external candidates, which would be attorneys that are in other firms. They're great attorneys. Maybe they don't have equity opportunity in their firms. Maybe they've been in-house. Maybe they have their own firm that they're starting, but would love an opportunity to grow their client base or otherwise. Really, we look to both. And when we started the Law Practice Exchange, we really dealt with that separately. So if you said, hey, I think my associate of five years is going to be my buyer. We would focus, put that sell package together, customize it for that buyer, and then present it to them and really help sellers have that discussion. Hey, I want to make sure that this firm continues. You're a key asset, everything else. But what we found is, again, sometimes they're not interested. Sometimes they want to do it. They just can't get over emotional, mental, financial hurdles to do so. 
So what we do now with clients is really we go and cast the nets a little bit farther. And our goal is to say, yes, let's talk to internal candidates, but let's also look to the outside market and make sure we can find you one a buyer that's a good qualified buyer and continuation plan, but also the right one to spend a year, six months, 18 months, whatever it is, talking to your internal candidate, going along in the process, and then not having it work out is we've lost that you know year, six months, 18 months, whatever it is. So our goal is to really say, let's bring the most choices to the table. Because again, it's a fairly young marketplace and it's not always that we have a lot of choices, but we want to try to maximize that and bring it. Once we go through and we start having those confidential discussions and they all are confidential, we're really working to have you find who would be a good culture match, who would be a good caretaker for what you've built. And we encourage that early. So, I mean, if you know your associate or your junior non-equity partner, that's easy. But for marketplace options, we encourage conversation and meeting early because you as the owner of a practice who have been a great steward or you as the potential buyer may just decide this isn't going to be a good match because all of our deals and all the deals mostly in the marketplace are transition based, meaning you're going to work with them after closing. And so you want to make sure you have that early match, and then we can go into financials, negotiations, cutting a deal, working on transition plan, everything else from there. Makes sense. But I think what I'm hearing you say is that even if you think you know who you want to sell to, it's an internal person who's already on your team, it's still worth sort of having this outside look and process. And that makes sense to me because as someone who's been through the process, I started a firm with a partner and we added a couple of partners just lots of transition in the law firm, those are hard questions to navigate sometimes by yourself. And I could imagine having that third party even come in and help with what evaluation would be so helpful and just make the process a lot easier because emotions are always going to be involved, especially if you know the person. Absolutely. I think there's a lot of things where you could both be on the same page moving along. Valuation is probably the biggest thing that those who have had discussions reach out. They feel like they have the right buyer, but they need help on price and structure. So that's the valuation piece where they'll reach out and say, can you help us with this? And then the next question usually as a follow-up is once we get over that hurdle, what do we do next? How do we develop a transition plan? What are the sales structures that we should really look like? How does this work from an announcement side with clients or otherwise? And that's the other piece of what we think we bring is process and accountability. So hopefully we have that expertise, you know, that knowledge base, but it's built into our process. And so a lot of times it's just knowing what's step one and what's step five. And if step five is when you're done and everybody's looking back and smiling, wonderful, or it may be step 10. And so our goal is to help you along that as well. Again, there's lots of good advisors, but as you know, through the Lapster community, accountability can be a key factor as well, because we have people that have reached out and say they've been having discussions for years. They just don't know where to go next, right? And so we'll help them go there next. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I had one lobster that I worked with, and it was a close situation of a family member retiring and selling the firm. And it felt like the retirement date just kept getting pushed. (laughs) So he he would call me and he'd be like, oh, now he wants to stay another six months. Oh, now it's another three. And it was, you know, it's very frustrating. If you're the buyer, you're ready to get going. And so I could see too, sometimes having that outside accountability and someone pushing you on deadlines and process would make the whole transition a lot easier. We talk a lot, of course, to the boomer generation and those that have built firms that would be looking to exit. And it's such an emotional decision, too, for them, even though outwardly they say, I'm ready, I'm ready to sell, I need to do this, I want to get out of here and go spend time with my grandkids or whatever else. Emotionally, they are a lawyer. That's how everybody knows them. And so the fear of, oh my gosh, I'm not going to be that one day keeps them from sometimes making those next steps, actually pulling the trigger on a deal that sets a timeline and a path for their eventual exit from the profession. Again, selling your law firm and your ownership does not mean you have to stop practicing law. 
I tell people a lot of times what we do is we're just trying to develop the route or the path for the train to go. When you decide to step off and get off on whichever stop you want to is your choice. But if you don't have track, you haven't developed that track and you don't have somebody to take over and direct that train after you step off, then we've got problems. Yeah. Again, a lot of that fear, we try to say it's not about stopping the practice. It's just about having a continuation plan for your firm. And you know, that's where that successor, that buyer comes into the picture. That makes so much sense. In terms of timing, I hear you saying that a lot of these deals as the seller, you'll have involvement after the fact. I mean, every deal is probably different, but is there a typical time frame in terms of when someone should start thinking about this? If they see retirement three years, five years on the horizon, is that too soon or that's about right or... And I think that's perfect. Usually, again, if we're working with clients, it's going to take us some time to sometimes get the financials we need, go through that priority goal setting, really get approval. That could take a couple months to a few months. Lawyers are busy and getting their attention and kind of getting documentation that sometimes they're not used to looking at takes a little bit of time. But if you are three to five years away from retirement, now is the time. And our overall goal is to say, look, it could take anywhere from six months to 12 months potentially to start developing buyer interest from the time you kind of get ready to go. And that's just because, again, we're going to go through discovery, then we're going to get everything ready, go into the marketplace, and it takes a little time to kind of saturate, to reach out, to start generating those good potential conversations And then once you have them, surprise, surprise, lawyers typically do like to negotiate. And then again, lawyers get busy and that's not always our sellers, that is sometimes our buyers. So it takes them a little bit longer to get back to us and that process can go. And then once you reach a deal, you might have a couple months to four months of due diligence time, that time to get everything worked out. And then that's probably a year into the process almost from when you decide I'm going to get out, I'm going to sell to actually having a solid opportunity. And then afterwards, we tell all of our owners, our sellers to expect at least two years post a transaction with the thought that the first six months is working as hard or a little bit more of what you've been doing full time or anything else, because you're transitioning, you're mentoring, you're turning over management, legal cases, you're having to show that. And then after that six months really starts to slow down for you, whether that's just management's off your plate and you're still doing legal and that's what you want to do, or if it's continuing forward to introduce clients, be that goodwill ambassador. Overall, on the two-year mark, you should pretty much be wound down with most practices, really at the 12-month mark. But again, some attorneys want to sell their practice and continue in practice law until they can't. And so they just won't be an owner, but they'll be able to still be a practicing attorney. So three to five years is perfect. The big thing comes down to as well is knowing what your needs, your priorities, and otherwise are. If you're a young firm overall and you're just ready for a change or maybe you've got a new opportunity, one of the things that you definitely want to address first is, do I need this law firm to meet my financial needs? And if I do, would selling it get the amount of value out of it that I need to kind of match? And so sometimes it may be you're not ready yet because you still need to own and run this firm for a couple more years for your personal benefit. But our goal is to kind of focus on that early in the process so we know. Makes sense. So we need to take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. When we come back, I want to dig some more into valuation because I know that's what everyone's thinking about. Support for today's broadcast comes from Text Expander. Work smarter, not harder with Text Expander. Text Expander helps you work faster and smarter so you can focus your time on your most important work. With just a few keystrokes, Text Expander keeps you consistent, accurate, and working efficiently. Speed through emails, expand forms with fill in the blank fields using a quick abbreviation. Use Text Expander's powerful shortcuts and abbreviations to streamline and speed up everything you type. Get your message right every time by expanding content that corrects your spelling and keeps your language consistent with a few keystrokes. Show listeners get 20% off their first year. Just visit textexpander.com forward slash podcast to learn more. Support for today's broadcast comes from Postali. Building the next powerhouse law firm takes hard work and an entrepreneurial spirit. 
but some skills escape even the savviest of attorneys. To reach new heights in your legal practice, you need a genuine marketing partner, one that tells you where you are now and where your firm could go. Postali works with law firms nationwide, and their trademarked marketing fiduciary services sets them apart from every other vendor that's cold calling or flooding your inbox. Whether it's informal guidance about things you can do today or a big picture approach to law firm expansion, Postali is perfect for business minded attorneys with an eye on the future. No matter where you are in your journey, Postali is the full service, strategic marketing partner that grows with your firm. To learn more about the services Postali offers, visit postali.com forward slash lawyerist and reach out for a free consultation. Support for today's episode comes from ESQ.marketing, an agency that provides successful SEO strategies for every stage of your practice. You will work with experts in legal marketing. All of their intense focus is on helping attorneys generate more clients and cases from the internet. They don't work with anyone else. You'll breathe easy with low-risk, month-to-month contracts. There are no long-term commitments. ESQ Marketing earns the right to work for your firm each and every month. Best of all, you'll get direct access to the person working on your account. No account managers to deal with. No lost in translation with your requests. To see if you're a fit, visit esq.marketing forward slash lawyerist to get started. Support for today's episode comes from Sweet Process. Sweet Process is software that enables companies to have a central place for all their procedures, processes, and policies. It makes it easy for management, managers, and their ground-level employees to collaborate on and continuously improve these documents together. Sweet Process becomes the one source of truth, the one place where every employee, regardless of their role or team in the company, can go to find information on how work is done. Sweet Process makes it easy to train new and existing employees because your documented procedures are already in Sweet Process. So, when employees are getting tasks done, the instructions are right in front of them. Sweet Process offers a 14-day free trial, but by using our dedicated sign-up link, you can extend that to 28 days. Just visit www.sweetprocess.com forward slash lawyerist to sign up now. No credit card is required. All right, so we're back and I'm sure everyone is curious, how do you even value a law firm or I'm a solo lawyer? Surely my firm doesn't have value. How would you answer those questions? Uh, Yes, your firm has value. As I mentioned earlier, behind the question, I don't think you can sell a law firm or even if you can, I don't think you can sell mine. I'm a solo practitioner, X, Y, and Z. Lawyers, as we all know, we're trained to think of ways that things won't work, right? And so value is one of those that I think a lot of lawyers, just like billable rates, otherwise are going to decrease their own value and brand. And overall, the value of a law firm is the phone ringing, emails coming in, referrals being sent over, clients that you have helped maybe for years on an ongoing basis. It's your marketing, it's your team, it's your systems, everything you've built. So I always tell people is if you don't really think, even if you got a small law practice in some small town and you don't think that you have value, try taking a vacation for two weeks and then coming back. If when you come back, everything's piled up, lots of phone messages, everything else, you have value to your firm because those are needs that somebody else could help meet and hopefully could generate revenue while taking care of those clients, everything else as part of it. So that's value. How we look at value is really mostly with, you know, small to mid-sized firms, there's value attached to you as the owner, the personal attorney relationships that you have. So we'll call that your personal value. And that's why we focus a lot on that transition after closing so that we make sure we can transfer what you've built personally, referral sources, clients that know and call you and refer everybody to you, those different things, your expertise, your knowledge that you can transfer that over to a buyer over time. The other is the firm value, and that really is marketing, website, phone number, client files, active, ongoing, you've built systems, you have team, you have a known office space, all of those things that can really transfer pretty quickly. And then once you really get to the numbers, we're usually historically looking at revenues, 
and what you've done historically on revenues. We're looking at your overall earnings for the firm, not your salary necessarily, but the earnings from ownership of the firm and some other things. We're going to look to potentially case inventory, assets that you may have that a different firm doesn't, and really try to come up with a predictor of what is your specific value. But the overall concept as we try to predict value or pricing is what you've built in the past and what you've done in the past. If we are successful in finding the right buyer, developing the right transition and sale plan, then that buyer should be able to do the same numbers as well. So our goal is to basically say, if you've done a half million in revenue, then a buyer hopefully should be able to do the same if we've addressed that in transition otherwise as we carry it forward. Are there things that a lawyer could do to increase their value? Like if someone's listening to this podcast, maybe they're 10 years out or however many years out, what are some tips you would tell them to start thinking about their business differently now? Delegate. Delegate. Love it. You know, to give credit, what started the law practice exchange in my head, one was jealousy. I was an attorney, CPA, dealing with a lot of other professional practices who had figured out how to build and exit for value. Dentists, CPAs, even doctors, insurance, otherwise. And the other was I read a book, Built to Sell, by John Warlow. And it's a great quick read, very basic concept. But the concept is if the business is all you... You don't really have a business or it's going to be a heck of a lot harder to get the value you want for the business. And so what I'm always amazed by is lawyers that have really built a business model or are working on it to essentially delegate and be a manager of the business, but not be the business. And we deal a lot with, again, traditional law firm models where they're going to need a little bit more transition time otherwise to potentially sell. They can do so successfully. But if you're looking today to maximize, once you delegate, then you find out that you're able to step back. You're hopefully less needed in the process, in the revenue performance. And you're also forced to build process systems. So delegate. I mean, just start delegating today and then you're not going to delegate and say, see you guys, you're going to help make sure that that delegation is successful and that will build value. It'll be easier to sell. You'll get a higher price, better terms, everything, because a buyer can see a practice that runs without the owner as a much more solid investment than one that is all about the owner. And this is what we preach all the time to our labsters and I was even thinking when you said earlier, if you come back from vacation and things are piled up, that means you have value. And I was like, well, for our folks, it's a little bit the opposite because we are training them now to go ahead and take those vacations and have their firm run without them because that shouldn't be what they're doing day to day. They should be running the business, managing the business, building those systems and processes. So I love this and I love knowing, I love seeing the future. Kind of my big takeaway is if you've built what we'd call that traditional law firm, where maybe the business is a little bit more about you, referral sources think of you, clients think of you, there's still a way for you to transition your practice. It just may have that transition time where you have to stay involved after this close to make sure it transitions well. But for the other folks who are bought in and are thinking about their business like a business, I too had that aha moment when I read Built to Sell years ago. And I was like, yes, this makes so much sense. Like for you guys, there's a cool future ahead because you're building this thing now and the marketplace is going to be there when you're ready for it. And you can start doing the things you need to do now to maximize that value. And that makes so much sense to me. Absolutely. I mean, it is a business, right? It is a calling, a profession for most, but it needs to be a business because you can do more for clients and for yourself and your team and everything else if you focus on those elements. And those type of proven business models are easier to transition to transfer. Because again, you and I were having conversation, you know, uh, personal injury is a big movement, of course, you know, with Utah, Arizona, everything else. If you have a large PI firm, love to talk to you because we have buyers out there right now. But personal injury, again, is a space that because of the investment they've had to make in marketing, you know, dollar wise and other words, that we've seen pretty amazing business models come out of that. 
And overall, it's just one of those that, you know, as other practice areas, other groups evolve as well, it just becomes easier to one, get the terms that you want to pass on a great business model to that next generation. And everybody feels like now we've bought into something that really works. Yeah. I don't want this point to be missed. One thing that I love is that you are an attorney, correct? right? Like me, we both have practiced and we understand it. I think for lawyers, like that just brings an element of comfort to the process. Like we get the ethics rules, you understand, you know, so I'm sure you've heard all the things people like to throw up. Well, I heard there's an ethics rule around this and and it can't be done because of this. And I guess what I would just brag on you for is, yeah, you get those and you know how to still transition, help someone transition within the bounds of the ethics rules, that there is a process that you can go through. This is absolutely a path that's available to you. So that makes me super excited. We can talk forever about this. In fact, we've already come up with at least three or four more topics that we we're going to cover in another episode because we just don't have time to do it all today. So a few teasers for our listeners, deal terms, like there's a gazillion different ways to structure these deals. And I think you've hinted at a few of them here, but there's probably more we can do on that. And for the buyers out there, how does it work for you? How do you get outside financing? What does that look like? There's so many different things we're going to need to cover and can cover. So I'm excited to have you back, but really happy to have you on the show today just to get this conversation started and get people thinking about this opportunity because it absolutely exists. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me and look forward to continuing the conversation. The Lawyerist Podcast is produced by Bailey Tiller and edited by Ryan Croft. Are you ready to implement the ideas we discussed here into your practice? Wondering what to do next? Here are your first two steps. First, if you haven't read the Small Firm Roadmap yet, grab the first chapter for free at lawyerist.com slash book. Looking for help beyond the book? Let's chat about whether our coaching communities are right for you. Head to lawyerist.com slash community slash lab to schedule a 15-minute call with our community manager. The views expressed by the participants are their own and not endorsed by the Legal Talk Network. Nothing said in this podcast is legal advice for you. 